Well, good evening. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we welcome you to the Lord's house as we close out the Lord's day together this evening in worship. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to a handful of events happening here in the life of the body. Men's basketball is happening tomorrow night here at 7 p.m. And a half hour earlier at 6.30 p.m., there's a ladies' coffee chat happening at Old European Coffee located at Bridgeway Station. And Tuesday, for those who couldn't make Monday night, maybe you want to go to both. There's another coffee chat at First Watch on Woodruff Road, and that's at 9.30 in the morning. Ladies, you also have an opportunity to serve our community by packing meals at the Meals on Wheels Center this month. Uh, please see Terry Negron with any questions about this event, should you have any. A regular Wednesday night activities this week, that includes children's singing school, dinner, cat kids, and our prayer meeting will be led by missionary Steve Jessen, who works with the Sheds for Hope, and this is a ministry, denominational ministry, which assists families after disaster by equipping the church to respond. If you plan on attending dinner this Wednesday, please RSVP via the link in the church-wide email uh, no later than tomorrow. Uh, lastly, uh, next Sunday we have the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper in the morning service, and after the evening service, the deacons will host an ice cream social, so you'll want to stick around for that. If you're a visitor with us this evening, we are delighted that you've chosen to worship with us here at Woodruff Road. We'd ask you please fill out the blue card in the pew in front of you and place it in the offering plate as it comes by or hand it to one of us in the narthex after the service so that we can greet you and get you connected with what we're doing here at Woodruff Road personally. I hear shortly tonight's sermon from John 17 will highlight true Christian unity. Now, but let me first ask you all, how do you define yourselves? How do you define yourselves? When other people ask you to tell them a little bit about you, what do you say? If one of your friends or co-workers is asked to describe you, what would they say? If the fact that we are Christians is not one of the top answers given to any of those questions, it may be that we're elevating other parts of our identity above that of Christ. As Christians, the most important truth about us is that we are in Christ and therefore must pattern our lives after the Lord Jesus. That being said, let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of the triune God. Hear now the words of the Lord as he calls us to worship this evening from Psalm 124, verse 8. The psalmist writes, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's respond to the Lord's call to worship now by standing and taking your Trinity Psalter hymnals and turning to Him 181 as we sing, Now thank we all our God.
confession this evening comes from Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And necessarily, in order to now exercise faith, we must also exercise repentance. And we'll confess our sin together this evening using the form found there in your bulletin. O oh, merciful God, we humble ourselves before your holy majesty. We acknowledge that we have frequently and grievously sinned. We are unclean before you, O God, and deserving of death. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Be pleased to have compassion on us, our gracious God. Wash us in the pure fountain of Christ's blood, so that we may become clean and white as snow. Cover us with his righteousness, and make us well-pleasing in your sight. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now the promise of God to those who truly repent of their sins and trust in Christ, not from Colossians, but rather from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor coveters, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. standing and take your copy now of God's word. It's our Old Testament reading. It comes from the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 9. This is God's holy, inerrant, and authoritative word to us this evening. Please pay careful attention. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name one. Men shall not live by bread alone. In his second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul exhorts the church to give selflessly and to do so cheerfully. In chapter 9, he writes, So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our Lord wants our hearts, and so it does little good to give to his work with a clenched fist, holding on to every last coin. Instead, we must give joyfully, understanding that giving is not mere obedience to a command, but it's a chance to further the work of the kingdom. With that in mind, let's now pray as we give back a portion of what God has so generously and so graciously given to us. Our Father, how we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, and in doing so, Lord, you've instructed us on that we, as your people, are to worship you, the living and true God. So now, Father, we pray that you help us to worship you with cheerful and obedient hearts as we lay before you these tithes and offerings, that which, Father, belong to you. Help us to trust that you will use them to bring about your glory. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Most Holy Father, we come to you tonight with fear as well as confidence. We come as children to a Father who is able, who is ready to help. We come praying together and praying, Lord, for one another. Together, Father, we confess that your name is holy, that we glorify you, and you have already glorified yourself in every way in which you have made yourself known. And we pray still more that you would use us to glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for your creative and redeeming work in all the earth, and especially with us. We pray and ask you that you would destroy the kingdom and work of Satan, that we might see the triumph of the kingdom of your grace. Lord, let us see your hand at work as you expand it day by day, even as we live in a culture that increasingly forsakes you. May it make your reign and victory more glorious as we are not only preserved in holiness, but also that you would conquer your enemies with your grace, that we might see the fullness of your kingdom coming in. Oh Lord, we pray that you would make your will done on earth as it is in your presence in heaven. We pray that by the grace and work of your spirit, you would make us able and willing to know your will and to obey you in it, not just in the ways that are convenient to us and not just in the ways that are visible to others, but in every place where your eye can see and your ear can hear. Lord, make our obedience even like your perfect angels in heaven. Father, we pray and ask that you would continue to provide us the bread for each day, that we would be provided for in what we truly need. We ask for neither poverty nor riches, but that you would provide for us in the ability to sustain our families, to have food on our tables, to be able to work with our hands and give to others, and that in all these things we might see you as the source and as the provider, and so recognize our blessing and call you blessed. We pray, Lord, as individuals and as a congregation that you would kindly and graciously and for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our substitute, that you would forgive us all our sins and all our transgressions. We pray that in light of our forgiveness, we would be able to freely forgive others as you have so clearly called us to do. And Father, because you have made us willing to forgive, we might have the peace of Christ among us and true unity in this body. We ask, Lord, that your grace would not only release us from the debt of our sin, but much more that we would be kept from sin and kept from temptation. And when we are tempted, you would grant us such a generous influence of your spirit that we would be kept then from sinning. And Lord, we come to you knowing that you are our king and we are your subjects, the subjects of your kingdom. We know that you alone have the power to grant what we ask of you and that all of our asking is for your glory. It is for your glory that we praise you for your holiness. It is for your glory that we would see your kingdom come in. It is for your glory that we would do your will, that we would be fed and cared for by you, that we would be forgiven our sins and kept from sinning. Father, we ask you these things, that you would do them by the power of your spirit and for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose very name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we reverence and give honor to the reading of God's word again to us this evening. From John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, this too is God's holy and errant and authoritative word to us. Pay careful attention. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Please take your Trinity Psalter hymnals again and turn to him 287. As we sing together, lift high the cross. <laughs>
you have your copy of God's Word in front of you, I invite you to turn to John's Gospel, chapter 17, as this evening we will continue along providentially from this morning's theme of bearing one another's burdens, and tonight we'll be examining verses 20 and 21. Chapter 17 is a famous chapter. Many of us know this is where we find Jesus' high priestly prayer, and this prayer is broken up into three sections. Jesus, in the first five verses, prays about his own glorification. Our Savior says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And he continues along in prayer from verses 6 through 19, focusing on those first believers, the disciples. Again, Jesus says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them, he says, from the evil one. Tonight we'll notice as we begin the conclusion of his prayer, Jesus praying to the Father for those who will believe through the ministry of the disciples. He says that they may all be one. Christ focuses here on the unity of the visible body of believers. Thus a prayer for believers today as it was for those previous generations of believers. The Lord Jesus is concerned not about the pain he will soon suffer, but on the eternal glory that awaits him and those he will save through him. In this final section of his prayer, Jesus has the full attention of his disciples. They're in the upper room, and the only thing that remains before Gethsemane, before the cross and his glorious resurrection, is the pouring out of his soul, those burdens, he says, for all believers. On the cusp of Calvary, rather than being debilitated, Jesus' affliction is that of mutual love and the spiritual unity of the new messianic community. Hours before his humiliation and death by crucifixion, Jesus, we see, is petitioning the Father for those who love him, who declare that he is Lord and bow to him as God the Son in all the fullness of his deity and with faith in all the fullness of his work, that their love and that their unity be grounded among the members of the Trinity, among the members of the Godhead. So the question before us this evening is if we as God's people are not unified and we don't love one another, how can we expect our mission to be successful? In order to answer that question, we're going to consider three points this evening. We'll see Christ as the mind, as the source of Christian unity. Christ is the model of Christian unity. And Christ is our motive. He's the motive of Christian unity. Jesus' prayer, you see, is not just for salvation to be experienced in the lives of God's people, but also that the shared life among God's people, God's people on earth, would truly reflect the mystery of the shared life of the Godhead in heaven. So before we go any further, let's now seek the Lord's help as we prepare to understand the word before us. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we bless your name. For your word, it is truth. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. You intend to build us up and equip us for every good work. Your word is inspired. Every word of it is God-breathed. Every word of it is without error. Every word of it is the final rule of our faith and life. So we pray by your spirit that you would open our eyes to behold the wonderful truths from your word and that we in turn would live that truth in our lives for the glory of Christ. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask each of you for an example of unity, how would you describe unity? What would you say? How would you answer? Right, likely, I assume many of you would think back to a day when things were at peace, or times you might say were easier. Maybe a time you'd say where people knew their neighbors and agreed on most things, at least those most basic of things, that faith, family, and freedom. Personally, I immediately think of the greatest generation, those men and women born between 1901 and 1927. Journalist Tom Brokaw wrote in his book titled, The Greatest Generation, he says that these men and women fought not for fame, so they didn't fight for recognition, but it, it was the right thing to do. Unified in their rationale that working together for the greater good was indeed the right thing, he says it was the right thing to do. That's what they concluded. How ironic is it then that the greatest generation gave birth to the generation whom author Helen Andrews said fed a wonderful, successful, and stable society into a wood chipper. The very instant they could have any influence on society, this generation otherwise known as the baby boomers. In her book, Boomers, The Men and Women Who Promised Freedom and Delivered Disaster, Andrews profiles six baby boomers in order to show how the baby boomer generation, in her words, dealt an uncommonly good hand which makes it truly incredible that they should have screwed up so badly. They inherited prosperity, social cohesion, and functioning institutions. Yet they passed on debt, inequality, 
waning churches, and a broken democracy. It doesn't take much to at least consider her rationale here, though, when examining today's cultural climate. How then does one go about describing that seemingly rare commodity otherwise known as unity? Well, for starters, you don't become like the world to reach the world. That's not how that works. And that is precisely why Jesus' prayer for Christian unity here in John chapter 17 is desperately important to those gathered in this room this evening. Because there's nothing that's more important for all who claim the name of Christian than to grasp as well as to understand the teaching of this particular section of Scripture. The loving and genuine friendship of, of a fellowship of a united church is the instrument of choice to demonstrate to the world that the gospel is indeed true. And in verses 20 and 21, we see where that unity, that cohesion comes from. And rather, we see who that unity comes from. And it's Jesus Christ. Our unity is in Christ. It is in union with him. Jesus is the mind, he's the, the model, and he's the motive of the Christian's unity. Only through Christ are justified sinners, made sons and daughters of the covenant community, the adopted children of God. And that's our first point this evening, is that Christ is the mind of our Christian unity. He's the source of our Christian unity. Just there is no miner without a coal mine. There is no Christian without a Christ. Verse 20 reads, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Right? Jesus throughout this prayer is concerned with many things. But in his final earthly prayer, he made unity his chief concern. It's what he's focused on. And we know this because he explicitly states three times this for emphasis in verses 21, 22, and 23. Furthermore, on that same night, the night in which he was betrayed, where he had celebrated the Passover with, with his disciples... In John 13, 35, Jesus tells them, he says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you do what? If you love one another. That being the case, that this type of unity is brought about not by the efforts of mankind's ingenuity, but by Jesus giving us the glory that the Father had given to the Son. We know what happens when man tries to unite on his own terms, for his own cause, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. We've seen it before. The saints in heaven and the ones surely to come did not and will not get there by building their own tower. All who believe in the Father have faith because of Christ's life, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, his intercession, make possible God's gracious gift of faith. Colossians 2 Verses 9 through 10 read, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him for who is the head of all principality and power. The power to believe comes from Christ's intercession, whereby he sends the Spirit to bring light to those in darkness. However, everyone coming to Christ must actively believe in him because he does not believe for us. But here we see that he prays for those who will certainly believe. Christ then informs his disciples that they will bear witness about him. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, bears witness about Christ. All right, thus the apostles will also bear witness about him because as we're told in John 15 verse 27, they have been with our Lord from the beginning. Faith comes by, as each of us know, faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word preached in the name of Christ by the power of the Spirit preached by the apostles whose gospel word makes believers. Thomas Manton, English Puritan, clerk of the Westminster Assembly. Manton notes divisions in the church breed atheism in the world. Manton says divisions in the church breed atheism in the world. But you know the opposite, I think we can argue, is also true, right? Unity in the church builds belief in the world. If the church is united, the world will believe that Jesus really came from God. And just to be perfectly clear, I'm not affirming that every building that calls itself a church is to be united. No, quite the opposite, because Jesus himself, he has a standard for those who bear the name Christian. And he says that much in verses 6 through 8 of this chapter of John 17. Therefore, some division is inevitable. Because there are those who call themselves Christians, and it's not that we sit in judgment on others, but when you face the word of God and seek to be guided by it, there are some who 
according to our Lord, use a designation of Christian wrongly. So when we talk about a united church, we speak of a Bible-believing, a gospel-preaching church made up of believers sanctified by God the Father who are actively pursuing man's chief end of glorifying the Father and enjoying him forever. Lest we make the mistake that Canaanites no longer dwell in the land. Unity in the church builds belief in the world. There's nothing decidedly different about doing what the world does. How many of you tonight are living your lives at the altar of the world and finding comfort in its numerous vices, willfully, slothfully, or passively subjecting yourselves or your spouses or your children to the fruitless passions and pleasures found all around you? I'll argue this isn't different. This is the opposite of different. Christ's death paid in full the penalty of your sins, and the cross provided forgiveness and eternal life. And knowing this to be true, do you still set aside time to call upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, rather than making Christ your supreme study? Friends, if we are to be different than the world, we must not go about other gods and live about our days shouting, O Baal, answer us. Just turn to 1 Kings and see how that ended up for Solomon. The church exists to know and proclaim the glory of the triune God in the face of Christ. And in Christian churches today, that truth is desperately under attack. Different means inviting your neighbors into your homes for, for dinner and family worship. Different means taking responsibility as parents and communicating the faith to your children with the scriptures, and with the catechisms. Different means setting aside your cellular device and being okay without updating your internet friends about what you ate for breakfast, what you had for lunch, or the yummy dinner you made. Because while his parents announced the arrival of their baby boy to their network of friends and family, Different wasn't born in a palace. Different was humbly mounted on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Folks, I hope you get the point. Jesus is different. And we must be careful not to live like the world because Jesus calls us to maintain a holy witness in an unholy age. If the world is to see Christ in us, then we must be the ones who present the world with a different vantage point. It's the only way. When genuine Christian unity is faithfully demonstrated, it's irresistible because it's a supernatural work that points to a supernatural explanation. That being Christ in us. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So secondly, with Christ serving as the, the mine, the source, the supply of Christian unity, if we are to be different than the world, then by grace, we must apply ourselves to the study of imitating our Savior. We must apply ourselves to the study of imitating Christ. Therefore, secondly, Christ is the model of Christian unity. And Christ prays for a supernatural unity that's modeled and enabled by the Godhead. He says, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So what kind of unity? Supernatural. And that the eternal unity that exists and lives between the Trinity is something entirely beyond human understanding. We simply cannot understand how three can be one and one be three at the same time. And while no one can compare to our earthly fathers, the scripture tells us that in our heavenly father, God is three persons. And yet the three are one, one eternal substance, three persons, and yet not three gods, but one God. The same in substance, equal in what? Power and glory. Moreover, he's unchangeable in his being, in his wisdom, in his power, in his holiness, in his justice, in his goodness, and in his truth. And don't you wish that was the content that the world was streaming as they turned on their televisions each night? Or these were the words that were sung to the most streamed songs listened to daily. It doesn't get more unbelievable than that which is truly unbelievable. Let's take it a bit further, though. 
The greatest theme of the New Testament is that in the one person of Christ, there are two distinct natures. Perfect God and perfect man. Truly God and truly man, yet he is not two persons. One person, two natures, yet they are not separate because there is a perfect unity between them. Verse 21 tells us that Jesus and the Father are one. And for this, the the union of the Father and the Son, Jesus says, it is this Trinitarian unity that is to be the model of unity amongst believers. So while the answer is much more complex when asked how the Father is in the Son, what's made clear here is that the Son is in the church through the indwelling presence of the third person of the Godhead, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The unity of life is in that mystical union found there in the Godhead. And the unity of the Spirit within the church is joined by, Paul tells us in his letter to, to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 3, the unity of the Spirit within the church is joined by, he says, in the bond of peace. This is a unity that cannot be legislated or brought about by any man-made organization, but is rather a oneness created by the unifying presence of God's Holy Spirit. Therefore, having unity in the Spirit, Christian unity, is unity in the truth. And why is that? Why is our unity as Christians unified in the truth? Because we know that the Spirit indwells those who believe Christ's word. And as Jesus told his disciples back in chapter 16, John 16, verse 13, to anticipate, he says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you, he says, into all truth. Not half truths, not partial truths, but he says, in all truth. The Christian's only access to the knowledge of the living word is through the written word. This unity can only be then a unity in belief, as well as a unity, as we've seen, a unity in truth. Martin Lloyd-Jones comments, what makes the greatest unity is the common faith, what we believe, what we, he says, have received together, and what nobody else, he says, has received. That is the unity which our Lord is concerned about in this chapter. It is all entirely dependent upon this particular word, and it is only as men and women are agreed about this word and accept it, and subscribe it to the same faith, and to the same common salvation, that there can be any conceivable unity among them. Any other unity, he says, is of no value whatsoever. Additionally, Rick Phillips, my favorite, second favorite minister here in Greenville, very powerfully states that God's truth alone would sanctify the church. He says God's truth alone would sanctify the church And Jesus prayed only for those who believe in God's word because it's what? Because it's true. How can Christians then have unity without truth, he asks. The answer is that a unity without truth is something other than Christian unity. The unity that our Lord was concerned about, he says, is a spiritual unity. A spiritual unity in the truth of the gospel. Therefore, it is truth that determines the bounds, the parameters, the bounds of our unity, just as it is in the truth that the Spirit bonds us, unifies us as one. So if if we are looking then at the local church, how do we apply this to us? Well, first, Christian unity... Christianity itself requires us to believe what the Bible says. Faith in Christ depends upon Scripture's divine character and Scripture's testimony. And when you remove obedience to Scripture, you remove true spiritual unity. Further, Christian unity requires us not to add to the Bible. No extra biblical nuancing that that minces the word of God into heretical babble. 2 Peter 2 verse 1 reads... But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Francis Schaeffer speaking to this point 
He comments, the real chasm must be between true Bible-believing Christians and others. Not a lesser point. But the chasm is not between Lutherans and everybody else, he says, or Baptists and everyone else, or Presbyterians and everyone else. He says, the real chasm is between those who have bowed to the living God and his son Jesus Christ, and thus also to the verbal, propositional communication of God's word, the scripture. Them, he says, and those who have not. Lastly, with Christ as the mind of our Christian unity, whose life, death, and resurrection presents us with the perfect model of emulation, we see that with a proper and richer understanding of, of what is experienced between the Father and Son, will in turn have further consequences. That brings us to our final point this evening, and that Christ is the motive, the motive of our Christian unity. That the world may believe that you sent me. That the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus prays for unity for the sake of his followers' witness. Right? So that the world may believe. He, he tells us right there. The church's gospel mission relies in large part on our unity in the faith. Right? Because the church is made up of redeemed sinners... And we share oneness with each other as direct beneficiaries of Christ's intercession. Right, just as Jesus disclosed the unseen God to the world by taking on flesh, by becoming flesh, so the church will be a visible revelation of the unseen Father and of his love. Simply put, the world needs to see our unity. Because the unity of the church is evangelical. It's a unity der derived from the witness of the church. That the world may believe that you have sent me. We are to make known the message which elicits faith. That those who will believe in me through their message. Right, the faith produced in the world through the unity of the church is expressed in Christ's own mission. Jesus, we know, was sent by the Father to do the Father's will. And this fact is of very first importance. This indeed is the gospel that Christ descended from heaven and took on flesh. Not to be served, but to serve. And to give of his life as a ransom for many. How then do we apply these two verses this evening? Well, when, when we put this all together, what does it mean for you all? It partially means that accepting outward unity only, the type derived from attending the same church, or sharing the same values, or having made the same membership vows is the most diluted expression of Christian unity. Unity from the heart, which is in fact what we are being called to here, means making the effort to seek after one another, even when it inconveniences you, or might make for a difficult conversation, so as to grow closer to one another till that bond mirrors the profound unity of the Godhead. The call of Jesus Christ to you is not just to go along to get along, but to pursue your brothers and sisters in Christ, to pursue and serve them, and to know them. The Apostle Paul makes this exact point in Romans 12, 13 with his exhortation to the folks there in Rome when he says, distributing or contributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Secondly, furthermore, that what these two verses have put forward is that through Christ... You were loved by the Father in just the same way as and with just the same intensity and commitment with which he loves his Son. How greatly then should you fear and dread that any preference or comfort or self-serving agenda should disunite the family of God and diminish your experience of God's divine work in each of you through your bond and faith in Christ. And why is that? Because the gospel mission relies in large part to your unity rooted in truth, in the faith. What Luther started led to Calvin, and from Geneva led to Edwards and Whitfield and Tennant, because the Lord has chosen to work through those united in gospel truth to further his plan of redemption by turning the world upside down for Christ. 
in Jesus' thinking, a church that adorns the gospel truth with a living testimony of God's supernatural love simply cannot fail to gain the world's attention. They have to notice. And while this world carries on in unbelief, it's more and more difficult to argue against the reality that Christ is the true expression of God's love towards humanity. Thirdly, each of you are gathered here this very moment, not because your parents handed down their membership to the Country Club Church, but because when you received the mercy God offered you in Christ by faith, his perfection was imputed to you and your sin was imputed to him through the cross. Your sins were paid. Thus, when we gather together on the Lord's Day, what are we doing? We're declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's not just kind of different. It's cosmically different. It's forever different. It's life-altering different. So when the saints gather on the Sabbath and corporately worship him in the way that he has directed, we literally come into the presence of the Almighty God, and that, too, in itself is different. And this is not just another day, and the enemy wants us so desperately to treat today as such, but our presence here this evening declares what? That we won't do that. We bend the knee to one king, and his name is Jesus. And in his kindness, when we as God's people, we hear his word preached. When the sacraments are administered and we pray in his name, we can expect our mission to be successful. United, we respond to these means of grace with more praise, with more adoration, and more thanksgiving. This is how we can expect our mission to be successful. So may we then... Only look to Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, the mind, the model, the motive of Christian unity. And as he begged the Father with the utmost affection for this, for our unity in him, for our Christian unity, might we likewise beg for the Sabbath day, where we come together as a body of believers, and by the Spirit through faith are reminded that what the world deems outdated, it's just a book. What the world deems outdated, it's just a table. What the world deems insignificance, it's just a little bit of water. God, by design, uses for truly extraordinary ends and for our joy and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory and praise as a lover of sinners. We give you glory and praise and thanksgiving, O Jesus, our Christ. As a lover of sinners, we give you praise, O Spirit, who brings all of this to bear upon our darkened souls that we might know the love of our Father through the Son. May he be exalted. And may he be praised for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing in response to the preaching of God's word. Psalm 222, O God, our help in ages past.
receive now the Lord's blessing and his benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.